So yeah, I'm very happy to be uh, to be here. I'm going to be talking for about 30 minutes and then open it up to questions after that. Um, the talk is two halves. The first half is really about what is this big data thing to educate you guys so you are aware what big data means. And then the second half is the startup story of Cloudera, how Cloudera came to be, uh, and some lessons that I learned as, uh, as I was founding this uh, company. So with that said, briefly about myself, I got my, uh, my bachelor's and master's from uh, Cairo University in Egypt. And then I came here to Stanford to get my uh, PhD. And uh, my goal was to get my PhD from Stanford and then go back to Egypt and teach. Uh, I really like to teach, and uh, my dad is a professor in Cairo University of Economics. He also really likes to teach, so since I was very young, he told me, you're going to grow up and you're going to be a professor like me. And that was my goal, to get the PhD and go back to Egypt. But then uh, Stanford corrupted me. <laughs> uh, Stanford, as you know, is a very entrepreneurial school. Yeah, you have speakers from the industry coming in to talk all the time. You have uh, uh, lots of classes like this one on entrepreneurship and, and so on. So I became very curious about this entrepreneurship thing very quickly. And that led to me actually taking a leave of absence out of my PhD program in uh, 1999. And I started my first company, which was called uh, Viva Smart. And we were acquired by Yahoo a year later. And we were very lucky to be acquired by Yahoo uh, just before the guillotine fell down, which is the explosion of the, what was, what the so-called internet bubble that was happening in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, we had just to, as a point of reference, we had about 20 other startups doing the same exact thing like us. And they all failed. They all shut down during this bubble explosion. It was a very bad explosion, actually. Uh, so we were kind of very fortunate and lucky that that happened to us. And then uh, my dad kept nagging me and saying, telling me, hey, Amr, you have to finish your PhD. And I told him, Dad, I'm richer than you will ever be. I was already sold my company to Yahoo, made some very good money from Yahoo. And he insisted, no, you have to finish the PhD. So I told Yahoo, I want to go back and finish the PhD. And they said, uh, OK, we'll let you go back and finish it, but you have to keep working for us. It was hard to find a professor at Stanford willing to take me as part time. Most professor wants you uh, to be full time, because you're going to be working on many other things beside your PhD. Uh, but luckily, uh, Professor Mendel, Loz uh, Mendel uh, Rosenblum, who is, as you know, one of the founders of VMware, uh, and one of the best professors in the computer science department, uh, I'm biased, obviously, he was my advisor. He took me in, and I finished my PhD with him in uh, around the middle of 2008. And then I uh, left Yahoo at that time and started uh, Cloudera, which I will tell you about uh, in the next couple of slides. But before I, I, I do that, I wanted to briefly tell you the story of artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is one of the key things that we are helping to enable as a company. Uh, our product is around and about that, and I'll explain what it is in a second. But these three guys, obviously, they're very famous, and uh, lots of the credit for this machine learning and AI falls back to them. Uh, Alan Turing, 1940s, so that's 65 years ago, he came up with the Turing test, which many of you would know as one of the very first tests to uh, check whether we have built something as smart as a human. And the idea there was to have two rooms. One room has a computer running AI. The other room has a human. And you cannot see which room has which. And you're talking with them, and you cannot tell. And that's kind of when we achieved intelligence. Uh, John McCarthy and uh, Marvin Minsky, uh, they kind of coined the term artificial intelligence. And uh, John McCarthy, he came up with the Lisp programming language, one of the very first uh, symbolic languages for artificial intelligence. And uh, Marvin, Minsky, Mar Marvin Minsky actually came up in, uh, uh, again, again, we're talking about uh, 50, in the 50s, so that's uh, 60 years ago, came up with the first neural networks that actually work. And then you hear all this hype about deep learning and neural networks. That was already demonstrated many, many years ago. But in the 80s, a, uh, the AI winter hit. We had this AI winter where all of the funding from the US, from Japan, all of the research stopped in AI. It just completely stopped. And it kind of died. AI research died. And then. If you roll forward to today, we have AI around us coming back everywhere. We have machine learning algorithms coming around us everywhere. We have the assistants like Siri and Google and Alexa that we can converse with. We have real-time translation in Skype and Google that can translate better than we can as humans. We have facial detection in Facebook that, again, can do facial detection quicker and faster than we can. And then we have these deep learning um, neural network algorithms like AlphaGo that can uh, 
not only beat the best Go players in the world, but come up with new techniques that the Go players are learning from the, the machine, how to play the game in a better way. So the question that I'm going to ask you, and I'm hoping a couple of you here can give some answers, uh, and I have three answers to that question, is why? Why is machine learning coming back? Why is AI becoming more feasible and doable and happening today? So just raise your hand and say something, all the way in the back. Yes, that's one of the three reasons, is the computational power needed to do this at scale is today becoming more economical than ever before. Back then, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, only organizations like the Army or space organizations that had the budgets to buy super, super computers could actually do this. Now anybody can do this. What else? That, that is the key reason. The key reason is today we are able to get the data that is needed to make this happen. The, hard, the third reason is harder to guess, but if anybody uh, wants to venture a guess of the third reason, Okay, we'll get to it then, we'll get to it. So the first reason is absolutely what you said, is today <clears throat> we are more sophisticated than ever in terms of our ability to collect data, not just from the machines and, and the stuff happening in the online world, but from the offline world as well. Because of sensor networks, mobile devices, satellites, cameras, we are able to collect data about everything. And I'll give you many, a couple of examples later on from our customers, actually, of how they're using this. But one of the examples I really like to, uh, to use is the ATM machine example. When you went to take money out of an ATM machine uh, 20 years ago, you would put in your uh, ATM card, you would put in the PIN number, and the only information that was captured was person X at time T took out Y dollars from account number Z. That was it. We call that structured data. Today, when you go to an ATM machine to take out money from the ATM machine, there is a camera in the ATM machine taking a picture of your face. The touch screen on the ATM machine has sensors that measure how you move your hand, and how you move your hand is a biometric signature that can be used to identify you. Uh, the cell phone, if it has the app for the bank, then we know you're standing right there in front of the ATM machine. So in addition to this very small piece of information, person X, time T, Y, dollars, account Z, we have this mountain of information, and that's what we call big data, that allows us to truly tell who is standing right there in front of that ATM machine and whether this is a fraud transaction or an actual transaction. So now today we joke and we say the only people able to steal money from your ATM uh, account are uh, Mission Impossible people because they need to copy your face and copy your phone and all of these kind of things. Though I was in a trip in Malaysia about uh, two months ago and I was talking to the Malaysians about how ATM machines now become much harder to penetrate because of all of this big data and AI, facial detection and so on. And they said, we have a much bigger prob problem you're hoping you can help us with. And I told them, what's your problem? And they said, uh, our thieves, they come in and they come use a bulldozer and they just take the whole ATM machine somewhere else and open it up and take the money from inside it. And of course, I told them, that's not a big data problem. That's a much harder problem that we can deal with. But uh, the number one reason why this is happening today is we have the data today. We did not have the data. It was very hard to get the data in the past. Today, we can get the data much more efficiently. You can see some statistics here, like 90% of the data that we have in the world today was generated uh, within the last two years. 90%. And that's because within the last two years, that's when our sophistication with sensor networks, with mobile devices just exploded in, in terms of advancement. And we're only leveraging half a percent of that data effectively today. And the growth trend is really expected to continue in the next uh, four years, going up from 4.4 to 44 uh, zettabytes. So that's the number one reason. The number two reason, which you guys also identified correctly, is the abundance of scalable computation. Is today we have the storage, the memory systems, the CPU and GPU subsystems, the scalable cloud architectures that allow us and allow any company to, to do this at scale. And then the number three reason is open source allowed us to democratize the advanced algor algorithms needed to do this at scale. So this started with Google back in uh, 2004. Google uh, published these two papers called MapReduce and the Google File System, which were the foundation of how to start to do scalable computation using commodity hardware. And uh, Yahoo, to their credit and to Google's credit as well, but Yahoo, two years later, they took the concepts from these papers and they implemented them into open source, which gave us this, gave us the birth of Hadoop and this big data platform. 
in 2006. We only had these two things, HDFS and MapReduce, but they were open source. They were being developed in the open source community with collaboration from many, many companies, including ours. And then if you look what happened over the next 10 years is this massive innovation. People building other systems on top of these systems, borrowing ideas from them, leveraging them in new ways, and that created this very, very rich, rich ecosystem of uh, software and tools and programs that allow any company today to go and build these super advanced machine learning and AI algorithms. So really, the answer to the question I posed to you at the beginning is this is happening today because of the combination of three factors. The first one is the data is available. The second one is computation is available. And then the third one is the algorithms are more available than ever before. So what do we do at Cloudera? At Cloudera, we take all of this open source goodness that's out there, and we package it in a very uh, easy to use, fast, secure platform that our customers can deploy within their organizations to solve these problems using machine learning and AI. That's really what we do at the company. You can think about us as very similar to Red Hat for Linux. So Red Hat, they take Linux and they make it more usable for the enterprise. We take all of this big jungle of uh, <laughs> open source projects that you can see on the far right there, and we put them together into a form factor, a platform that is easier to use by organizations. Some of our customers use us on-premise, meaning inside of their own data centers. And some of our customers use us in the cloud, uh, on top of Amazon or Google or otherwise. And the key thing about this platform is the ability to work with any type of data, whether that be structured data, person X at time T took out Y dollars from account Z, or semi-structured or unstructured data like images, social media, et cetera, at, <clears throat> at any volume, and then do any type of analysis. One of the most common ways to analyze data is a language called SQL, SQL. SQL is a very powerful language, but there is so many problems that we have today that cannot be solved by SQL, that need more than SQL. And that's what's special about our platform compared to standard uh, database systems, is our platform can work with any type of data, structured or unstructured, at scale, and then can allow you to tackle that data, extract value from that data using SQL, or going beyond SQL if you need to go beyond SQL. So we have a number of other frameworks that can analyze data in newer ways. So now I want to give you some examples to make it more concrete what exactly do we do. And uh, the first example is from the insurance industry. And before I talk about it, I want to talk about a hack, a uh, trick that we, many of us came up in uh, different industries to deal with the fact that we could not scale. We could not scale our processing to millions of users or millions of customers. So we came up with a trick that's called segmentation. So what is segmentation? Segmentation says instead of going and trying to target or model the behavior of all of my 10 million customers, I will instead build a 1,000 segments, married with children, married without children, this age group, that age group, this income level, that income level, living here, living there, and then I'll try to map, fold all of these 10 million users into one of these segments. And then I do my targeting or my fraud detection or my offers or my advertising based on these segments. And the problem with this approach is the, the good news about this approach is it worked and it helped us do this for many, many years. But the problem with it is it leads to false positives. You will end up many, many times making wrong conclusions about specific people by lumping them in segments that they, yes, have the same characteristics as the segment, but they don't behave anywhere like that segment. So for example, uh, in the internet age, many 10 years ago, 20 years ago, before we did proper segmentation, and we use these techniques of lumping everybody together, whenever I would go to browse the internet, so I'm a male in the age range of uh, 40 to 50 years, all of the ads I would see would be golf ads. And with all due respect, if you love golf, I, golf is not my sport, I don't watch it, I don't play it, in fact, I, I almost hate golf. <laughs> it's not my thing. Yet I would get golf ads all the time because I was folded into that segment. On the other hand, my son, who is uh, a teenager and loves video games, continuously gets video games ads when I also love video games. I play video games all the time, and I have to go and ask him, what's the latest ad that you have seen here or the latest ad you have seen there? Because his age group was being folded into the right segment, he was just lucky that that was happening for him uh, at the time. So same thing in the insurance industry. Uh, in my house, I, I am the lowest monthly premium for car insurance. I pay the lowest insurance uh, per month because I'm a male in the age range 40 to 50. My son is the highest insurance premium in our house because he's a teenager male, <laughs> which is much worse than teenage females, I guess. 
in terms of my, my, my daughter, actually also a teenager, she has a lower premium than he does. And that is, uh, again, incorrect and a function of the segmentation. Because if you look at my son's driving behavior, the actual behavior, he's actually a much safer driver than me. He's always careful, very paranoid, never speeds up, stops at the stoplights all the time. Uh, I told you earlier that I am from Egypt originally. Uh, I don't know if you uh, have ever been to Cairo, Egypt. But in Cairo, Egypt, uh, when you're driving in the street, the stoplight is a hint. You can take that hint or you can go. It's up to you. It's, it's not really enforced very heavily. Speed limits are also hints. So my driving behavior is not as nice as my son's driving behavior because of that, yet I'm still getting the lowest premium uh, in the house. So what many companies are doing now, uh, insurance industry across the world actually, is putting these devices in the car that measure your actual driving behavior. How you speed up, how you slow down, where you stop, when you stop, when you take a turn left or turn right, are you using the signals? When you're driving on the highway, are you steady or are you wobbling? All of these kinds of parameters. And that is what is used to compute your insurance premium, not your age or your, your gender or your income level or where you live. It's now more a function of actually how you do and what's the probability of you having an accident because of how you're driving, your actual behavior. So that's a very, very big shift in many industries, not just the insurance industry. We call this the segment of one, the segment of one. So moving away from the segment of everybody to create a segment for every single customer, for every single user, for every single patient, every single citizen. So mentioning patients, this is another example of using data to give voice for premature babies. So premature babies, uh, they're, when they are in neonatal intensive care, their brains have not really fully formed yet, so their neural network <laughs> that they have doesn't know when to cry. So sometimes they will cry when they're happy. And sometimes they will not cry when they're very heavily distressed, which is a big problem for the, for the nurses and the doctors trying to care for them. So what our customers have done in this case is they built a, um, a predictive model that analyzes the signals coming out of the body of the baby, how they move, the, some of the brain waves, the pressure, the heart rate, the sounds they make, and a screen would show up on the monitor above the crib of that baby saying what's going on. Like the, a message would show up and say, I'm too distressed from the light in the room right now. It's too high. Please lower the light a little bit. And the nurse would go and lower the light. Or there's too much noise right now in the room. Or I need to be fed. So a language, words are being now prescribed to them based on the signals coming out of their body. And then uh, this is a very standard example of big data being used for doing one of the most common use cases in big data that's called anomaly detection. Anomaly detection, or the unknown unknowns, or finding weird stuff, finding weird stuff. So MasterCard is one of our largest customers. They have uh, more than 10 petabytes of data in their warehouse. And one of the most common attacks that uh, hackers do when they're trying to steal money from uh, credit cards is take a very small amount like two bucks, three bucks, to stay under the radar. Because none of us really call their company when they say three bucks. But we, if we notice 100 bucks, we will call them. And by doing that over many, many credit cards, it becomes very hard for any individual or even any bank working with MasterCard to catch it. But MasterCard themselves, because they have the view of the full data set, they are now able to catch these very, very sophisticated under the radar attacks using what's called anomaly detection. So that's a very quick flavor of some of the use cases that we have in our customer base. Uh, but in summary, and because before I move on to the next section, which is about startups, we at Cloudera strongly believe that there is a data revolution uh, going on right now. And this data revolution is as big, if not bigger, than the industrial revolution. So in the industrial revolution, what we learned as organizations and countries and enterprises is how to start leveraging machines steam engines and electrical engines to make carpets and make chairs and make uh, uh, stuff instead of using our hands, right? And that allowed us to significantly improve the speed, the volume, the throughput of manufacturing across the world. And countries that were able to leverage that and adopt that became the leaders of the world. And the same thing is happening now with, data, with the data revolution, which is there is a lot of sophistication being built out there right now about how can we take data and automate decision making uh, using data versus having humans have to be in the loop every time before a decision can be made. And these decisions can be business decisions at a very high level, but they can also be autonomous cars, how we drive a car. If you look at how we drive a car, 
That's really just about making a decision. What should I do exactly at this, right, at this time? And that will transform the world in very significant ways. So that's kind of the motion, the market, the movement that Cloudera is trying to enable. And uh, now I'll move on from that to entrepreneurship. I just want to check how we're doing time-wise. So we have until? We have until 3.20. OK, good. So I'll uh, keep my eye on the clock. Uh, so the Cloudera story so far, we have four founders in the company. I'm one of them. So I came from Yahoo. Yahoo acquired my uh, first company, as I told you earlier. Uh, Mike Olson comes from Oracle. And both me and Mike are still very heavily involved with Cloudera up to today. Uh, that was eight years ago when we started the company. There's two other co-founders who are less involved today, uh, Jeff Hammerbacker from uh, Facebook and uh, Christophe Bichelier from Google. We raised our first round of funding, round A, $5 million by a VC called Excel Partners. Excel Partners is famous uh, from being the first VC behind Facebook. It's one of their largest investments. And we raised that money in October 2008. That's when the financial markets were falling everywhere, left and right, because of the mortgage crisis that was taking place. So we were lucky. At the beginning of our journey, we were very lucky that we raised the money. And we were still able to raise that money and find an investor that's willing to buy our pitch. We only had a PowerPoint presentation and the four founders at the time telling them that we think there is a massive data revolution going to happen. And it's going to be called big data. There was no name, the name big data didn't even exist back then when we uh, said this. So we were fortunate from that perspective. But we started to deliver. We started to get to deliver results, started to have customers. Another VC came and said, we want to uh, fund you, uh, Greylock Partners. So we took another six million. A few months later, actually, it's not that, it's like six, seven, eight months later. And then uh, another one came later because we kept doing well and the story just kept going. Uh, we today at Cloudera raised in total more than $1 billion in uh, capital in the company. That's not our valuation, that's how much money we actually took as a company. And uh, we're using that money to expand globally. So we proved that the business model works in the US. We proved how this can solve uh, problems for financial companies, for health companies, for manufacturing companies, for governments. And now we're scaling that across the world. And when you're scaling, you need money to scale, actually, especially in enterprise software. So uh, we now have more than 1,500 employees across uh, 30 countries uh, across the world. Now, when you raise this much money <laughs> and you make so many rounds, you're going to hit with what's called dilution. And that's what I want to talk about in this slide. So first, show of hands in the room, how many of you uh, Know, know what dilution means, the word dilution means. If you raise your hand, it's okay if you don't know. I just want to get a rough estimate. So about maybe 30% of the room uh, raised their hand. So dilution is your ownership, your percent ownership of a company. So you can see this uh, stage one and stage two as an example here. When you start a company at the beginning, ground zero, just like there's nothing in the company other than you and your co-founder, you, uh, you, you, you make up this random thing called shares. Shares is a random concept. It's a myth that we made up, that lawyers made up, and uh, business and financial people made up to signify uh, your ownership in a company. Right? So we divide, it's like you think about the company is a real thing. The company is not a real thing. The company itself is a story and a myth as well. But think about the company as a real thing, like a pie. And then you're going to slice this pie into pieces. And each one is going to own a piece of the pie. And that piece is called a share. And your percent ownership in this company is how many pieces of pie you hold, how many shares you hold. So you start the company, say at the beginning, you're going to make 10 million shares. So you're going to cut the company into 10 million pieces. You're going to give each one of the founders, or both of the founders together, 8 million pieces, 4 million pieces each one of them. And then you're going to set aside 2 million pieces for new people that are going to join your company, new employees that are going to join you. So they get some ownership in the company as well. And at this time, when you're starting at ground zero, Every single piece in the, in the pie is really worth nothing. <laughs> there's, there's nothing yet. The company is still starting up. We didn't make anything. So the actual value is, is zero. It's very nominal. So the, the way to think about this, if you're looking at this slide, is your angle, your angle of ownership, your percent ownership in the pie is the number of shares that you hold, say in this case 4 million shares, divided by the total number of shares that exist right now. But that number will change in the future. So 4 million divided by 10 million is? 40%, that's how much you own. That will be the angle. The value, how much money you, you own, which is different than the, the number of shares, is going to be a function of the share price, how much value you have per share, which is the radius. right? So the more the radius, the more value you have. When you're beginning the company at the beginning, uh, you have nothing. The radius is zero, so you own zero. Even if you have a million shares, 10 million shares, 10 million shares, it doesn't matter. The value is zero. right? Now you go and you start to raise funding. So say stage two here, you went to raise money and you're um, 
talking to investors, and the investors said, we will give you uh, $5 million, but we want 10 million shares in the company. Right? So you have to print 10 million more shares, this fake thing, <laughs> the, the ownership in the company. The company now is going to have 20 million shares instead of 10 million. Print 10 million more for us. And we're going to give you $5 million for them, which means that the value per share is uh, 50 cents, which means the total value of the company is uh, what in this case? Uh, 10 million. The total value of the company is 10 million because they gave you 5 million for half the company. So the other half, it reasons to say that it's also worth half a million. So the total company is worth 10 million. But now what happened is this dilution effect I was telling you about. Because now what happened is the founders together, instead of owning 80%, which was 8 million shares out of 10 million, they now own only 40%, which is 4 million, uh, 8 million shares still. But the 8 million shares now are out of 20 million because we printed more shares. And that's what, that's what happened. Every time Cloudera went to raise more money, we printed more shares. We printed more shares in the company. So my ownership in Cloudera, I started with an ownership this big, and I kept shrinking, 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 shrinking. And it's a much smaller ownership right now. And some entrepreneurs, they freak out about that and say, oh, that, I'm losing all of my value. I'm losing. No, when you have to keep in mind that you're always comparing the percentage that you own as a function of the area of the slice you're getting. Yes, at the beginning, you had a very big percentage, but the radius was zero. <laughs> it was worth nothing. Now I have a smaller percentage. I'm not going to tell you exactly how much I own, but let's say I own 5% of the company, so 50%. But the radius is much bigger now. The share price we have is up from a few pennies to now dollars, 10, 20, 30, $40. Dollars, and the area of that slice is proportional to the radius squared. Every time you increase your radius by a little bit, your value goes up squared compared to the, the angle that you have. So it's a very long way of saying, don't obsess about dilution. When you're building a very big company, your goal should always be about value creation. How can I increase the value of this company and increase the per share value? That's what you should focus on 100%. Dilution is important. You don't want to go and just give shares to anybody, of, of course. You have to control it, but, but don't be shy about doing it, because that's how you end up building a very big uh, company. At least that was uh, my story at uh, Cloudera. And it's holding out well. It's playing out well for us. So now I have some uh, almost done. So this is my last slide, though this slide takes uh, some time, because it's, uh, it has lots of stuff on it. It's some of my advice that I like to give lessons learned as I was building out this company that I like to share with, uh, with other potential uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, the first lesson is, whatever you do, make sure that the idea, the thing, the mission that your company is after is something that you feel very passionately about. You feel extremely passionately about. And the reason why is the analogy and I know it's a funny analogy, but the analogy is like you're getting married. <laughs> you're getting, you're going to be married to this thing. You're going to be working with this thing day in and day out. Actually, more than more time probably than you put in an actual relationship. And you're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have many uh, fights within the company. You're going to have many problems. You're going to have a customer that's going to cancel on you at the last minute. You're going to have an investor that's going to cancel on you on the last minute. There's going to be so many much emotion and so much uh, strife. And the thing that's going to keep you going over and over and over again is the passion and the belief that you have in what you're trying to do. Uh, it's the same thing that I think keeps a relationship, um, a marriage going as well, is, is the passion and the love that you have for the other person despite all the bad things that are happening. So some companies go through what's called a pivot. A pivot is when you change what you were doing. So you're doing this thing. It didn't work out. So now we're going to do this other thing. If that happens and this other thing is not something that you feel passionate about, you don't have your full heart in, then you should leave that company. You're not going to survive it. As a founder, you're not going to survive it. As an employee, you might. But as a founder, very hard, because you carry a much bigger load than, a, than, a, than an employee. So that's my number one advice by far. And in fact, I do some angel investments right now. Like I, I don't do a lot of angel investments, but I do maybe a couple a year. And one of the key things I look in the eyes of the entrepreneur I'm talking with is, are they? do I see that the passion jumping out of their eyes? I, do, do I see this? absolute love of the thing they're trying to do. And if I don't see that, they're not getting my money. <laughs> and I think a lot of VCs actually, they, they invest in that way as well. So it's very important that you have that. And be genuine about it. Not, don't fake it. You can't fake it. It's very hard to fake passion. Uh, number two, and some, sometimes, sometimes people find this controversial, you need to know how to hire great people. Uh, but more importantly, you need to know how to fire them very quickly as well. When you're starting at the beginning, 
and you only have four people, 10 people, 20 people, up to maybe 100 or even more. Cloudera now is 1,500, so we're past that point. But in this very early days of a company, of a startup, you're competing with massive other companies. Like uh, We were competing with IBM. IBM has like an army of people that can totally uh, obliter obliter obliterate us in any account we try and, and, and uh, attack. And the, the only way you're going to win, despite all of these odds and despite these bigger competitors, is, is by having amazing, amazing people in that founding team. That founding team needs to be flawless, in other words. It's like a sporting team uh, playing football or playing uh, baseball or whatever. Everybody needs to be playing, and everybody needs to be the best at the thing they're doing. And when you're a very young startup, as you will see in my next bullet point, you always have this sense of urgency where you need to be moving very quickly as well and, and advancing very quickly as well. So you don't have time to train people. Like some people are good, and I know if I were to spend more time with them, I can change them, I can make them better. But you don't have that time. You don't have that luxury of that time when you're a small startup. So the right thing to do is to let them go. Right? When you discover that one of the employees in this very early team, even one of the co-founders, is not really playing at the same level that everybody else is playing, is not putting the same, not generating the same impact. It's not about time, it's about impact. Or not fitting from a culture perspective, culture is very important as well, then it's time to make a change. And it's very hard to make a change, but it, it has to be done. And that's what I think, that's what makes Silicon Valley so special when it comes to this, compared to Europe or many other, uh, Asia and many other countries are trying to replicate the same thing that we have here is our willingness to do it, but our willingness also to do it in a very humane way, in a very, in a very decent way. Like we take good care of these people when we're letting them go. We help them find a new job. We, we give them some shares in the company still. We give them a big severance package, et cetera, et cetera. So, but it's important. It's part of what you do. Later on, when you grow as a company and you have, uh, say, uh, I would say more than 400 people, then now the impact of any single person divided by 400 is not really that as big. So now you can afford to spend more time with them, training them and coaching them and, and getting them into a good state. So now today at Cloudera, when we're 1,500, we don't fire people like that. We, we, we take our time. We, we, we do try and make them better. But when, when, we, when we're very young, when only 10 people or 20 people and one is not doing well, the impact is going to be felt by everybody. The whole company will slow down, and that's where you need to be quicker uh, about making corrections. Um, this lesson, I'm sure you guys heard this over and over again. It's one of the core ethos of uh, Silicon Valley and of startup uh, culture, which is don't be afraid uh, to make mistakes. Right? So we strongly encourage at Cloudera, since day one, all of our employees to try to do things in new ways and not be afraid to screw things up. It's just part of our culture and part of almost every startup culture here in the Valley. The key point is if we see the same employee failing in the same exact way over and over and over again, that's bad. <laughs> right, that's called failure. There's a big difference between failure and between failing. Right, so failing one time and correcting and learning, excellent. We love that. Continuous failure, very bad. Right? And that's, that, it's very important to know the difference between these two concepts. Sense of urgency. Uh, even today at Cloudera, 1,500 people, we, um, 30 countries worldwide, we're doing very well revenues-wise. But we know that there is many competitors coming up behind us. And even when we were just five people, that was true. Even now, 1,500 people is true. And even if you look at big companies like Amazon or Google, it's still true for them. You always have to have the sense of urgency, right? Like the thing that keeps you up at night is what's going to happen next from my competition that might make them leapfrog me? And how can I stay ahead of them? That should never go away. You should always have that sense of urgency. Uh, listen to your customers. So I, uh, I, in the first five years of Cloudera, I ran engineering as well. Now I focus mainly as the CTO, so more on the technical aspects. I don't really run engineering. But when, when I was running engineering, I would always tell our engineers, you have to listen to the customers and build backwards from what the customer is asking for. And they would counter me back and say, Amr, you're telling us we cannot be innovative. You're telling us we cannot innovate. We always have to do what the customer is asking. That means we're not innovating. And, and th that's a fallacy. That's a very big mistake. Innovation is not about innovating a new problem, <laughs> right? If you innovate a new problem that nobody has, nobody's going to buy the solution you have for that problem. Innovation is about innovating a new solution to an existing problem. And the hard part that we have as product designers and as engineers 
And frankly, the pitfall that we, many of us fall on uh, when we go for a PhD and become very heavy on the re research side is we lose this connection between did we innovate the problem or is this problem a real problem that people have? And before you start any significant effort, you want to make sure that the problem is a real problem, not one that you invented. Uh, one of the famous uh, quotes that I like from Henry Ford, uh, Henry Ford, he didn't really invent the car, he invented the pipeline that allows us to make assembly line that allows us to make cars efficiently, but he's frequently credited by, with inventing the cars. And the quote he said, when I asked people what they wanted, they said, we want faster horses. Faster horses. And this shows you your job. Your job as an engineer, as a product designer, as a company creator and entrepreneur, is not asking people what they want. <laughs> right? You always want to go back and ask them, what's your problem? What's the problem that you have? And they will tell you, the problem I have is I want to get from point A to point B very quickly. And now you know, okay, now I'm going to step out from that, think completely out of the box. All these perceptions about horses and how we used to do things in the past, I'm going to forget about. And I'm going to come up with a new innovative solution to solve that problem. And that's how you innovate. So never lose track of your customer and which problem you're trying to do. And never invent the problem. The failure that I see many entrepreneurs get into is sometimes they get so passionate, which I love, but then they get so passionate about a fake problem that only they have or only a couple of their friends have. <laughs> Right? And, and that's obviously a very big mistake to fall into. Have uh, faith in success. So by this, I'm saying positive energy is very important. I truly believe that positive energy, whatever that is, helps you increase the odds of success for yourself and for your company. You guys must have heard this stat from other people that talk to you. Only one out of every 10 companies funded, round A funded, not angel funded, out of angel funded, even lower. Only one out of every 10 will do well. Two out of every 10 will do okay. And the remaining seven will be either loss for the investors, and which means nothing for the employees. Once you're talking loss for investors, you mean nothing for employees and founders, or they will just shut down. So in other words, the chances of success is really 10% for funded company that got round A of investment. And if you look at company Cloudera, Cloudera now is in the, what's called the unicorn category, meaning we crossed $1 billion in valuation. The chances of becoming that is one in 1,000. So it's even much lower. Of every 1,000 companies funded that have the potential to be a unicorn, only one will be. So in other words, luck is very important. <laughs> luck is very important because uh, the other guys in these other 999 companies, they're also all of them working their ass off. <laughs> They're also, all of them, extremely smart, just like you are. And what will make you win is your luck, of course, your execution and how good you are, but your luck will play a very big part, and the positive energy that you have inside of your company. So with that, I actually also say, if you are uh, not a religious person, you have to wish for luck all the time. And luckily for us, our luck has been good. If you are a religious person, I usually say, ask your mom to pray for you, because you actually are going to absolutely need it to tell things in your favor as you build out your company. So with that said, uh, these are some books that I highly recommend you guys uh, read. Uh, they are very good when it comes to spotting trends and spotting what could be a, a, a new major opportunity. But in general, very good advice for how to start a company, how to build a product that people really care about, that they're going to pay money for, and just how to manage people and how to be good in life yourself. Like The Seven Habits, obviously, is a very famous book about that. And with that, I can uh, open it up for questions. How much time do we have for questions? We have 10 minutes for questions. And we're not going to leave here for 10 minutes until you ask questions. <laughs> First question. Do you believe there are any specific industries that are underutilizing big data? Uh, <laughs> very good question. So I'll repeat the question. Uh, do you think there is any industries that are underutilizing uh, big data? Uh, so. Right now, we actually are seeing all industries getting very heavily involved in this uh, space, including some ones that we did not expect at Cloudera. So for example, uh, we have uh, customers today in the farming industry, agriculture and farming. I never thought agriculture and farming would be using big data. But what happens is they have these sensors in the field that measure sunlight conditions, irrigation levels, and the rate of growth of the crops, the, co the color changes. And they do a lot of A-B testing experiments to maximize the yield out of their farms. So I wouldn't say there is any single industry that's really uh, not leveraging it, but some industries are better than other in the speed at which they're leveraging it. So absolutely, the, the faster moving industries now tend to be the technology industry. Um, the, the financial industry banks are very, usually very early adopters. 
telecommunication, so cell phone companies and cell phone manufacturers, and governments, to our, to our surprise, governments are adopting this technology very quickly, uh, both for cybersecurity and, and terrorism, uh, but also for tax collection. Tax collection tends to be one of the <laughs> things governments really care about, and uh, this technology is very uh, good at catching uh, tax evasion. Companies trying to hide stuff to smuggle money somewhere. So lots of governments are using it for that. Yeah. All the way in the back. I see you channeling Jeff Bezos quite a bit in your you know, customer focus and all. And I'm curious, when you're a very small company with, let's say, almost no customers, how do you, how do you try and adopt this focus of you know, what, what problems do people have if you don't really have people to yeah. focus on? So the question is, uh, how do you um, have this customer focus when you're still a very young company that has no customers to focus on in the first place. <laughs> and, and, and that is the hardest thing. I mean, that the, the hardest stage of any company is that f the first stage of discovering what the heck we're going to build and is this thing we're building solving a real customer problem. That's the first stage. The second stage is where you prove that, where you go actually and sell it and make money doing that. And then the third stage, which is the stage we are in right now as Cloudera, is the scaling stage. How do I take that and scale it? So that first stage, uh, it's trial and error. I mean, that, 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 that first stage is, is usually where this nine out of 10 companies will fail, is that first stage. Because first, hopefully, you have some good intuition of you yourself experiencing this problem. So in our case, uh, we were lucky that I experienced the problems we were solving at Yahoo. My co-founders experienced them at, at Facebook and Google. But even before we, we had that conviction, even before we started Cloudera, we still went out and we reached out to people in uh, some big banks and some big telecommunication companies. And we would go sit down with them and we would not tell them the solution we were thinking of at all. We would tell them, what are some of the problems you're seeing right now? And just listen and, and do pat pattern matching. Meaning, are we, see, are we hitting the same problems consistently, consistently over and over again? And uh, that, that was our approach. That's, that was the approach that we took to try and validate that the initial hunch that we have is this problem that we know is real because we experienced it. It's not just a problem for us and our respective companies, but it's a problem that's bigger than us. And uh, yeah, it behooves you to always try and do that research before you kick off your company uh, to make sure that in, at the meta level, you are solving the right uh, problem uh, to begin with. And then as you start to actually add, add customers and have customers using you, then it becomes easier later on to always have these customer panels you do once a month or once every three quarters where you listen to them and see what their needs are. Other questions? I will uh, ask myself a feeder question until you uh, come up with another question, uh, which is a question I frequently get uh, from students like yourselves. Should we finish? our degree or drop out and start a company? <laughs> and I'm assuming some of you might be interested in the answer. So uh, if you look at myself, I actually dropped out of my PhD to start my first company and then went back and finished it. Finished, finished it. PhD is different. So PhD is a, is a very long investment and my advice today actually to people is do not pursue a PhD unless you absolutely want the PhD for the PhD's sake. <laughs> in terms of your career, Assuming you don't want to be a professor. If you want to be a professor, obviously PhD is the only way you have to go get a PhD. But if you want a career in the industry, especially in computer science and uh, computer engineering, you will do way better in the market if you work right after the bachelor's or master's. Master's also does help. But PhD, actually, if you look at students that started at the same time as you, uh, you, you stayed for the PhD, they start in the market, their career overall longer term will, do way be will, fare, will fare way better than, than you would. Uh, so that's when it comes to PhD programs. And we have been discussing earlier with Roger that, yes, he's seeing that demographic shift happen here at uh, Stanford. Uh, when it comes to a bachelor's and master's, I, I'd say absolutely try to finish at least the bachelor's degree. And the reason why I say that is what I said earlier, is the chances of success of a startup is one out of 10. In nine cases out of 10, your startup will fail. <laughs> That's lower odds than many of the games you can play in Las Vegas. <laughs> and not only that, you will only find out four years or five years of your life after you invested, whether it worked out or not. So it's good to have a bachelor's degree that you can fall on as a backup plan to go and work somewhere if, if, if the startup did not work. So my advice always is, yes, please do go finish your degree first uh, to have that backup plan in your pocket. Other questions? Take a new question here, and then we'll come back to you. Um, so other than computer science degrees, what do you think some of the majors are that are the most valuable for careers at the moment? Uh, data science. So data science, meaning statistics and operations research and that kind of uh, trajectory. It's, uh, I mean, it's one of the most 
I would say, even more valuable than computer science right now. Like the, the demand for these kind of people that can uh, program, so they have some basic programming uh, principles under their belts, but they really understand math and, and, and uh, predictions and, and statistics and uh, advanced machine learning kind of topics way more needed as a skill right now. So I would, if I uh, can force my kids to <laughs> go towards some career, it would be that. <laughs> I, I know it's gonna be an amazing career in the next 10, 10 years. Yeah, very good question. All the way in the back. Thinking on like with PhDs and research and stuff, is it common that you see people taking their PhD research and trying to spin off, start a company from there? Because I know, especially in the tech industry, it's much easier to do that than in under in other you know majors or, or industries. Yeah. And I was wondering on your your opinion on that. Um, yes, absolutely. So I mean, many many of the great companies here in the Silicon Valley started because of that, right? Because of the PhD research triggering a uh, a um, idea for a solution that would not have been otherwise possible. Uh, VMware is a very good example of that. Uh, Google itself actually is a good example of that. So, so uh, yes, my answer to your question is yes. Other questions? Can you talk about how your day-to-day -day job has changed from like each stage and like talk about what day-to-day -day now is like? So the question is, can you tell us about your day-to-day -day job and how it changed from the first early days at Cloudera to how it is today? So I'll start today and then I'll go backwards. Today I'm the chief technology officer for the company. And uh, for an enterprise software company uh, like Cloudera, the chief technology officer, 60% uh, of their time is about evangelism. So it's tra traveling across the world, talking with customers and at public uh, events about how this technology can change their industry in very significant ways so that they become very attracted to the technology. So I sometimes joke and say CTO stands for Chief Talking Officer or also Chief Travel Officer. I travel a lot. <laughs> you know, like I travel, like, I'm, like all, last year I traveled like 500,000 miles last year alone. And I made the three loops around the earth last year in the opposite direction. So I lost three days of my life because of that. You don't get them, when you cross the deadline this way, you don't get the day back. So that's today. Uh, the, uh, the remaining 30% of my time is about the strategy of the company overall and the culture of the company. So as a founder, with my founder hat, I still play a very big role in setting the culture of the company, the type of people we want to have working for us. And then from a strategy role, are we building the right things, not for the next six months, but for the next five years that will keep us alive? Uh, so uh, I think uh, Greg Papadopoulos, who was the, I think he was the CEO of Sun, CTO of Sun, was CTO of Sun, has this very famous quote. He said, uh, to, to give you the analogy of what a CTO does versus the VP of engineering, VP of engineering does the implementation, CTO does the, 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 the kind of the vision. It's very similar to also the VP of sales and the CFO. So if a company misses their forecast, you don't blame the VP of sales as much as you blame the CFO that they did not project the math and the science that they're gonna miss their forecast. So in the same sense, if a company misses the deadline for delivering a product this quarter or next quarter, yes, you, bl you blame the VP of engineering. <laughs> but if the company builds the wrong product for the next three years, you, you fire your CTO. Like the CTO is the one that kind of is supposed to own that and make sure you're building the right thing. So that's kind of what I do today. And in fact, I have a very long article on this called What Does a CTO Do? So if you want to learn what a CTO does from my perspective, you can search for that online and you will find it. If I roll back to uh, four years ago, I was mainly playing the role of the VP of engineering, which is taking the requirements from our product teams, from our customers, and making sure we deliver that on time, and hiring all the smart people that we have in the company. And if you roll back eight years ago, when we were starting the company, we're doing everything, right? Like, uh, like we, I was assembling the desks for people when they come in. I would go buy from IKEA desk and make the desk for them. We, I was uh, setting up their laptops with the software they're going to need to be able to be productive in the company. Uh, from accounting and having QuickBooks to manage the, 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 the salaries of people and what we're going to do. So it was really at the beginning you're doing everything, which was fun but only for a short time. <laughs> and now it's fun but in a different way. So that's kind of the trajectory of how, uh, how it went. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for, uh, for being here today. And I hope this was useful and uh, informational for you. Thank you. in uh, around middle of 2008.
And then I uh, left Yahoo at that time and started uh, Cloudera, which I will tell you about uh, in the next couple of slides. But before I, I, I do that, I wanted to briefly tell you the story of artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is one of the key things that we are helping to enable as a company. Uh, our product is around and about that, and I'll explain what it is in a second. But these three guys, obviously, they're very famous, and uh, lots of the credit for this machine learning and AI falls back to them. Uh, Alan Turing, 1940s, so that's 65 years ago, he came up with the Turing test, which many of you would know as one of the very first tests to uh, check whether we have built something as smart as a human. And the idea there was to have two rooms. One room has a computer running AI. The other room has a human. And you cannot see which room has which. And you're talking with them, and you cannot tell. And that's kind of when we achieved intelligence. Uh, John McCarthy and uh, Marvin Minsky, uh, they kind of coined the term artificial intelligence. And uh, John McCarthy, he came up with the Lisp programming language, one of the very first uh, symbolic languages for artificial intelligence. And uh, Marvin, Minsky, Mar Marvin Minsky actually came up in, uh, uh, again, again, we're talking about uh, 50, in the 50s, so that's uh, 60 years ago, came up with the first neural networks that actually worked. So yeah, I'm very happy to be, uh, to be here. I'm going to be talking for about 30 minutes and then open it up to questions after that. Um, the talk is two halves. The first half is really about what is this big data thing to educate you guys so you are aware what big data means. And then the second half is the startup story of Cloudera, how Cloudera came to be, uh, and some lessons that I learned as, uh, as I was founding this uh, company. So with that said, Briefly about myself, I got my, uh, my bachelor's and master's from uh, Cairo University in Egypt. And then I came here to Stanford to get my uh, PhD. And uh, my goal was to get my PhD from Stanford and then go back to Egypt and teach. Uh, I really like to teach and uh, my dad is a professor in Cairo University of Economics. He also really likes to teach, so since I was very young, he told me you're going to grow up and you're going to be a professor like me. And that was my goal, to get the PhD and go back to Egypt. But then uh, Stanford corrupted me. <laughs> uh, Stanford, as you know, is a very entrepreneurial school. Yeah, you have speakers from the industry coming in to talk all the time. You have uh, uh, lots of classes like this one on entrepreneurship and, and so on. So I became very curious about this entrepreneurship thing very quickly. Needed to do this at scale is today becoming more economical than ever before. Back then, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, only Organizations like the Army or space organizations that had the budgets to buy super, super computers could actually do this. Now anybody can do this. What else? That, that is the key reason. The key reason is today we are able to get the data that is needed to make this happen. The, the third reason is harder to guess, but if anybody uh, wants to venture a guess of the third reason. Okay, we'll get to it then, we'll get to it. So the first reason is absolutely what you said, is today <clears throat> we are more sophisticated than ever in terms of our ability to collect data, not just from the machines and, and the stuff happening in the online world, but from the offline world as well. Because of sensor networks, mobile devices, satellites, cameras, we are able to collect data about everything. And I'll give you many, a couple of examples later on from our customers, actually, of how they're using this. But one of the examples I really like to, uh, to use is the ATM machine example. When you went to take money out of an ATM machine uh, 20 years ago, you would put in your uh, ATM card, you would put in the PIN number, and the only information that was captured was person X at time T took out Y. And then you hear all this hype about deep learning and neural networks. That was already demonstrated many, many years ago. But in the 80s, a, uh, the AI winter hit. We had this AI winter where all of the funding from the US, from Japan, all of the research stopped in AI. It just completely stopped. And it kind of died. AI research died. And then, if you roll forward to today, we have AI around us coming back everywhere. We have machine learning algorithms coming around us everywhere. We have the assistants like Siri and Google and Alexa that we can converse with. We have real-time translation in Skype and Google that can translate better than we can as humans. We have facial detection in Facebook that, again, can do facial detection quicker and faster than we can. And then we have these deep learning um, neural network algorithms like AlphaGo that can uh, 
not only beat the best Go players in the world, but come up with new techniques that the Go players are learning from the, the machine, how to play the game in a better way. So the question that I'm going to ask you, and I'm hoping a couple of you here can give some answers, uh, and I have three answers to that question, is why? Why is machine learning coming back? Why is AI becoming more feasible and doable and happening today? So just raise your hand and say something, all the way in the back. Yes, that's one of the three reasons, is the computational power. And that led to me actually taking a leave of absence out of my PhD program in uh, 1999. And I started my first company, which was called uh, Viva Smart. And we were acquired by Yahoo a year later. And we were very lucky to be acquired by Yahoo uh, just before the guillotine fell down, which is the explosion of the, what was, what the so-called internet bubble that was happening in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, we had, just to, as a point of reference, we had about 20 other startups doing the same exact thing like us. And they all failed. They all shut down during this bubble explosion. It was a very bad explosion, actually. Uh, so we were kind of very fortunate and lucky that that happened to us. And then uh, my dad kept nagging me and saying, telling me, hey, Amr, you have to finish your PhD. Uh, I told him, Dad, I'm richer than you would ever be. I was already sold my company to Yahoo, made some very good money from Yahoo. And he insisted, no, you have to finish the PhD. So I told Yahoo, I want to go back and finish the PhD. And they said, uh, OK, we'll let you go back and finish it, but you have to keep working for us. It was hard to find a professor at Stanford willing to take me as part time. Most professor wants you uh, to be full time because you're going to be working on many other things beside your PhD. Uh, but luckily, uh, Professor Mendel, Loz uh, Mendel uh, Rosenblum, who is, as you know, one of the founders of VMware uh, and one of the best professors in the computer science department, uh, I'm biased, obviously, he was my advisor. He took me in and I finished my PhD with him.